Tables or telephones are made out of physical matter, of course, and they don't experience pain or see colours. We humans, too, are made out of physical matter, and we know that the stuff out of which we're created somehow gives rise to or constitutes consciousness and subjective experience. For there's something it is like to be me. I feel pain, see blue, smell roses. So what about the table or telephone, since they're made of exactly the same stuff? Might it be possible that something similar could be said about at least some of the particles that make up a table or telephone? Might there be something it is like to be a particle in a table? Crazy? Absurd? The philosopher Galen Strawson argues that this conclusion may in the end be hard to resist. Galen Strawson, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Pleased to be back. The topic we're going to focus on is panpsychism. Now that's a, quite an exotic theory. I wonder if you could just sketch what it is. Well, there are many versions. You could also call it equally well pan-experientialism. It's the idea that everything that exists is somehow experience involving. Well, that is what I think. That's how I take panpsychism. The idea that everything that exists is somehow experience involving. Now, that means that the couch that you're sitting on is experiencing you on the couch, doesn't it? Well, I think that's a common misconception. I don't actually think that the couch is a subject of experience. What I do think is that all the particles that make it up may have to be. Although you've said that the couch isn't experiencing you sitting on the couch, it seems to suggest there is something that it's like to be for the particles that make up the couch. There's somehow a mind in the particles. That sounds like a weird kind of animism. That's exactly what I think. I think that there must be something it's like to be, say, an electron. It, I know it sounds completely crazy. It's not going to sound any less crazy until you ask me why I might hold such a strange view. <laughs> okay, now's the moment. Why do you hold this seemingly strange view? Well, my imagined audience here is always people who define themselves as physicalists. That is, people who think that everything that concretely exists is physical through and through. I myself am a physicalist, but if you're a physicalist, then there is one seemingly very large problem that you have to face, which is the existence of consciousness, or as I like to call it, experience. The question is, how can consciousness or experience exist if everything is physical? So what you're saying is that physicalism, which is this idea that everything, not just the behaviour of billiard balls, but also the experiences of human beings, can be explained in terms of physical particles, ultimately. You're saying that this physicalism leads to a position where there's a problem that somehow nudges you into panpsychism? That's right, for the following reason. People who are physicalists usually think that to be a physicalist means that you think that everything is in its ultimate fundamental nature completely non-experiential. But we then have the fact of consciousness or experience, the fact that experience exists, and that means that if everything is in its fundamental nature entirely non-experiential, somehow putting together entirely non-experiential things in certain ways has to somehow give rise to experience. And that seems to me to be impossible. It requires a kind of radical emergence. How could experience arise just from putting wholly non-experiential things together in a certain way or in a certain pattern? Because we can't understand now how that happens. It doesn't follow that it's impossible, does it? There is no argument here. It's just a great big intuition. Look, for many things, A and not A, you can get A from not A. A classic example would be liquidity. Individual water molecules are not liquid. If you put them together in a body, you get liquid. So here you can get A from not A. Here we have a different case. We have the experiential and non-experiential, and that seems to me a much more difficult case. I don't see how it could be that you could put the wholly and utterly non-experiential together in any way and then suddenly give rise to, as it were, the light of consciousness. How could that possibly happen? Here's the interesting thing is, is why have we as simply assumed that the physical is in its fundamental nature non-experiential? What's the evidence for that idea? And I'll give you the answer because it's mathematically precise. There is zero evidence for the existence of non-experiential reality anywhere in the universe. So why simply assume that the fundamental things are non-experiential and then cause this huge problem for yourself, which is the problem of how do I get the experiential 
than the non-experiential. Much simpler, simply to suppose that there is experientiality already there in some way, right at the bottom of things. I suppose one answer to your question is a kind of argument from strangeness, from weirdness. It would be very strange for me to go around thinking that a bit of paper has some kind of proto-experiential aspect to it. I agree that it seems strange, but I'm going to say it's just pure prejudice. It's simply an assumption. The thing about it is it's an assumption which causes this huge problem. If you make that assumption, then you have to somehow magic the experiential out of the non-experiential, which you just simply don't have to do if you suppose that experientiality is already there right at the start. We don't know anything about the nature of the physical that gives us any reason to think that its intrinsic nature isn't partly experiential. Well, I suppose there could be a third way. You've assumed that either physical stuff gives rise to consciousness through some kind of magical leap, and that's implausible, or physical matter contains some kind of experiential property. But perhaps the third option is to say, well, look, maybe we don't really have experience. It just seems that we do. Well, at that point, I say what I always say when people say things like that, which is that's the silliest view that anyone has ever held in the whole history of humanity. If there's one thing we know, it's the reality of consciousness, the reality of conscious experience. Since that some people who say that they're realists about experience turn out not to be really, I now say that I'm a real realist about experience. The best way to define what it is to be a real realist about experience is to think that experiences, experience of taste, experience of pain, experience of colour, is to think they're exactly what you thought they were before you did any philosophy, whether you were 26 or 16 or maybe even six years old. Another way out would be to say, look, it's, it's less absurd to suppose that we have immaterial souls that are the conscious bits than that panpsychism is true. Well, if you want to hold that view, then you have to be a dualist. And there are famous and well-known and totally unsolved problems with dualism. I want to be a monist. A monist in the sense that I think there's only one kind of stuff. Not a monist in the sense that I think there's only one thing. Dualism has famous problems about how the two substances, if they exist, interact. And those problems haven't been solved and aren't going to be solved. I'm committed to physicalism. I'm also committed to the reality, the real reality of experience. And it's from those two premises, if you like, that I, I move to the conclusion that there must be experientiality even in some of the smallest elements of matter. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is that I have to posit radical, or as some people call it, spooky emergence of the experiential from the utterly non-experiential. In principle, could this problem be resolved by science? Could scientists discover their mechanism within the brain that allows physical stuff to give rise to experience? I think that can't be done and will never be done simply because science has to produce publicly checkable results, has to be, is, as it were, essentially a third-person enterprise. I could never know for certain that an electron has experiential being. Science cannot evolve a vocabulary which includes experiential predicates. What I mean is it cannot have terms for experiential features because they are essentially private and they're not possibly publicly observable. I can never know what kind of colour you're observing right now. In fact, strictly speaking, I can't even know that you have a mind at all. It's simply not a possible object of knowledge for the natural sciences. So would it be fair to say that your position is that you believe that the way to understand the world is through the natural sciences? I don't think I'd put it quite like that because I don't think natural science is the, the way to understand the natural world, simply because I think that experience is itself is a certainly known natural phenomenon, a certainly known natural fact. And science in the sense of physics can't get at it. Of course, you know, experimental psychology increasingly takes it for granted. So in that sense, science does talk about experience, but physics and the harder natural sciences will never be able to get at it. One way of putting the problem is saying those people who call themselves physicalists are really what I call physicalists. That is, they think that physics can, in principle, capture the whole nature of the physical. But since I, as a physicalist, hold that experience is wholly physical, I reject that view. Some people listening to this might say, well, does it really matter whether you're a panpsychist or a more conventional physicalist? What hangs on it? I like to quote Schopenhauer, who said, 
philosophy is world wisdom, its problem is the world. This is what I think. Philosophy tries to get the truth about the world. Now, the world we live in is clearly a world in which physics tells us many truths. It's also a world in which, quite certainly, there is consciousness or experience. So I'm arguing that panpsychism, or at least what I sometimes call micropsychism, the view that at least some of the fundamental particles are experiential, I'm arguing that this is the most plausible view. Galen Strawson, thank you very much. Thank you. There's now a Philosophy Bites book published by Oxford University Press. For more information, go to www.philosophybites.com. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.ac.uk.